a life postpartum. My journey through postpartum depression. Written and read by Lisa Hardwick. Chapter 11. Lies. April 20th, 2018 was a very difficult day. Our air conditioner broke again the night before, and I couldn't fall asleep. The longer I couldn't sleep, the harder it was to calm down. I couldn't calm down, so I couldn't sleep, and I couldn't sleep because I couldn't calm down. I was a hot mess. Like a veil over my eyes, the sleep deprivation and high anxiety clouded any view of reason or logic as I started that day. I became irrational, and I couldn't see past my current circumstances. Everything became an absolute. I will never be able to sleep again. Lorelei will always be a stranger. Bonding will never happen. My body could never recover from this. I will always feel this hopeless. Every part of the day was a fight. From the first cries of the morning, the dashes to the bathroom to the mind-numbing depression, I was drowning. I spoke the scripture from Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things. That statement of strength was my inner preamble as I started each day, but the weight of the world and the lies from the enemy wore me down. The baby cried and the dog barked and my ears rang. It was so loud, yet quietly. Take all the pills in the medicine cabinet. You can make it all go away. The good shepherd was not the speaker. I knew it wasn't his voice, but it sounded so appealing. I was weak, physically, emotionally. I knew I had enough medication in the cabinet to kill myself. It seemed like a practical solution to the pain. Logical thoughts went out the window. The depression became too much. The lies began to repeat like a record player turning quietly but steadily in the background. Irrational thoughts became rational as the record wind on. Take all the pills in the medicine cabinet. You know there's enough to stop your heart. It will be easy. Lorelai won't even remember it. She can have a better mother. Just do it. Do it. Although I had entertained a few suicidal thoughts as my postpartum depression developed, this time the option to kill myself seemed so tangible, so comforting. I knew that these lies were from the enemy, but my broken mind couldn't see beyond this one moment. It was a temporary situation that appeared eternal. I wanted the pain to stop forever. I wanted the terror to leave my mind. I would do anything to escape my body. Go, get out, anywhere. Go, Lisa, go, the shepherd called. It was a rush for the door. I packed a bag and the baby, and we got out of the apartment and into the car. I took a breath. I had a key to my in-law's house, and I texted Stephanie that we were going to stop by so Lorelai and I could have a change of scenery. It was a Friday, and there was a chance she worked from home. Regardless, I knew it would be a safe place. I drove the familiar route to my in-law's house. I had pulled into the same driveway hundreds of times. It felt like home. I could see Stephanie in the kitchen as I sat in the car. 
I knew God planned for her to work from home that day. I knew I made the right decision to leave our apartment, although it didn't take any of the pain away. I did not want to live. I saw no reason for it. I'm just having a hard time, were the only words I could say before I melted into tears. I told her about the lies from the enemy that I couldn't fight by myself. I told her I had nothing left. I cannot keep going. She let me cry on her shoulder. Lorelai slept in her car seat on the floor. Oh, yes, you can do this, she told me with the confidence I knew I could believe in. Yes, you can. You can and you will. You don't have any other choice. You're exhausted. You just gave birth. You're vulnerable right now. Never forget, we are all in this together. It's not just you fighting. We are all with you. She handed me a cup of coffee, and we sat on the couch. She asked me if I could breathe. I told her I could. She told me to take another breath. I did. She said that is how I would survive the hardest moments. I had to sit in the reality of the chaos, breathe, and wait for the stress to wash over me. Like a tidal wave at the beach, the moment would soon end. Then I would breathe in another moment. I could no longer think about the next two million moments I would face in the future or what those moments would look like. I only had to survive one at a time. One moment at a time, one breath at a time. It sounded doable. We talked through my fears. She spoke truth to me over and over and over again until I began to believe it. Yes, you can, you can, and you will. Yes, you can, you can, and you will. We got through the next hour. I gave Lorelai a bottle while I watched Netflix. I sipped on a bottle of strawberry kefir, but I still found myself with diarrhea about every half hour. It just wouldn't stop. The sun came out, and I pushed Lorelai in her stroller. I took the familiar half-mile loop, and she cried the whole time. It was worth it to feel the warmth of spring. We got through another hour. Stephanie made me a plate of food, but I couldn't eat. I finished the bottle of kefir and watched more TV. I gave Lorelai her bottle, and we got through another hour and another. Each one felt like a tiny eternity. At 4 o'clock that afternoon, I headed home. I couldn't stop thinking about suicide. I wanted to go to heaven. I wanted Lorelai to have a better mother, someone who loves her and wants her, someone other than me. I couldn't do another day of this. I knew the enemy was working overtime to try and convince me of these lies. Why else would death seem so appealing? I drove past Keener Park. Everything was green. I thought about the times Noah and I hiked through their familiar dirt trails that wind in and out of the woods at the back of the park. I wanted to go back in time when it was just the two of us, but I couldn't. I thought about how devastated Noah would be if I killed myself. The initial shock would break him into a million pieces. He would have to live in mourning and unanswered questions. I could not do that to him. To me, could I cut my life short and forfeit any chance or hope? Could I be a coward and take the back door out of life? Yes. To Lorelai, could I take away the person she knew the best? 
Could I leave her without a mother? Yes. But for Noah, no. I did not want to hurt him. I wanted to give him his wife back. I felt suffocated when I returned to her apartment. It was the same, same pile of laundry, same baby bottles in the sink, same spilled powder next to the same expensive tub of infant formula. The baby cried and the dog barked. Nothing had changed. I was still drowning and hadn't slept in the last 40 hours. Stress hormones sent familiar shock waves through my body and left my ears buzzing. At 5 o'clock p.m., Heather knocked on the door. She had signed up to bring us a meal that day. Barbecue chicken, cornbread, green beans, and four huge cupcakes, each one a different flavor with a generous poof of icing. I still had no appetite, and just the thought of food sent me to the bathroom in pain. I explained to her that my stomach was still volatile. She asked me how I was doing, and I answered her honestly. I was not doing well, not at all. Heather was a friend from our church who also volunteered with the high school ministry. She had mentored dozens of high school girls over the past years, and she had learned how to be a patient listener. I told her that I knew the enemy kept telling me lies to commit suicide. You realize this is not Lisa talking, right? She asked me. This is not you. I know you. And this is definitely not you. Don't believe the lies. You have to believe in the truth. Noah came home from work soon after Heather left and our family made it through another day. One more day, one more victory, one single moment at a time.